Is this too loud or too quiet or just right? Uh, my name is Jeremy Simmons. I'm uh, an associate professor at MSU Northern. I think I know most of you. I don't know if people I don't know here, but um, I've been teaching in the Civil Engineering Technology Program full time since 2004. Um, and I see a few students here that it's kind of nice to see. Uh, but I'm going to talk today about scanning, how I use scanning applications in uh, construction few different projects as case studies and uh, give you a, a, another introduction. I won't go through the bio, that's on the website. I, I graduated from MSU, I got my master's at University of Washington, but um, I have a quote, look deep into nature, you will understand everything better. That's from Albert Einstein. But here's, here's me taking my kids deep into nature so they can understand the, the world a little bit better. I don't know if that works, but. <laughs> I had the bear spray, so you have to understand that. Uh, my beautiful wife, uh, Glacier Park a few years ago, and uh, that's the age you wish your kids would stay, but they keep getting bigger and bigger. And there they are there. This is the, the super dog Cooper. He likes going on hikes also. And then I threw these pictures in there for the Halloween. <laughs> so that's my dad joke. I, I won't tell dad jokes, because he never laughs. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, like I said, is a few case studies. One is the Moroni Dam Spillway Gate Project. Um, one is for quality control and grading applications in establishing slopes, and then measurements really with inaccessible points, which are difficult to measure uh, with conventional survey methods. And then at the end, I have a couple slides on how they might help students as they're uh, learning about these case studies. So I started off, and uh, about two weeks ago, I had 60 slides, and Lindsay goes, that's kind of a lot. You kind of talk a lot. You <laughs> <laughs> I'm an anonymous person told me that, so I added five more slides. Since <laughs> and I did this this morning. This is a preview. You get enough. Input. 
But uh, those are systematic errors if you know the temperature and the pressure, you can calculate a correction. Um, as I said, these are some mirrors that will reflect that. And it is dangerous to look at. So with the light, there, there's three different types on the total station that I have. So there's um, visible laser, not visible laser. The, the visible ones are like a laser pointer. If you point it in your eye, you can get a gamma. So there is a, a precaution with that. Usually that's used for the scanning. And preparing for this, I just learned that laser is an acronym, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. So that came about in the 50s, so that's what laser stands for. I thought it was um, just an anonymous name, I don't know. Um, over here, it shows uh, the distance and the accuracy. And maybe I'll go through these here. So this is what the, the total station measures. So it measures a distance and an angle. Those are the two things it measures, and then it calculates uh, everything else um, from a slope distance. And the two questions I get asked most often is how far can that measure? And this one can measure 10,000 meters, which is about six miles. So in, in practical, practical applications, everything measures probably within a thousand feet. You might have a mile shot or two mile shots, but not very often. Um, it's just not practical. However, I guess, Going back to the other slide with the prisms, there are a set of 100 prisms that were placed on the moon by Neil Armstrong. And from Earth, they can measure those and they measured them. I think they were placed in 69 and then measured them through the 70s. And they, they calculated the distance and they say the moon's moving away at 3.8 centimeters per year. So it'll go far. If you have a really good one, you can shoot 138,000 miles. Um, it can also measure off of a reflective surface, and the air there is about two millimeters. So this is a all metric. It's a maybe Switzerland, European, so everything's metric. And I think the standard in survey nobody expects a metric, but we use everything in feet in the United States, so we convert all of that to foot feet. Um, and then it will scan. So there's a couple different settings for scanning. From 300 meters, you can measure at 1,000 hertz, which is the fastest, up to 1,000 meters, which, again, that's uh, the conversion there, three quarters of a mile away, so maybe a little further. You know, math guys can help me out with that one. No. Um, but I've never done any measurements less than 100 meters. That, that's about as far as away as I want to get. Otherwise, it's too slow. You know, it, it would take too long. You could just easily move up closer and scan from that distance. And then the other common question I get asked is when you're set up, someone inevitably comes up and says, what are you taking pictures of? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a camera. I don't take pictures. However, this one does have a camera, 5 megapixel camera on it, so I can't answer that anymore correctly. Say, I'm not taking pictures of anything, just measurements. Whoops. All right, so the first case study, that, that was the background. If you have any questions, raise your hand. I'll try to answer them as best I can. Don't be shy about asking questions. Um, so I start out with the Moroni Dam. Does anybody know where the Moroni Dam is? If you're from the Great Falls area, you might be familiar with it. So I, I put in a quote for our history, uh, any history makers or professors in here? No. So uh, on June 13, 1805, Mary Weather Lewis was exploring the Missouri, and he came up somewhere in this area. This is close to Moroni Dam. Um, so uh, overlooked the most beautiful level plain, great extent of at least 50 or 60 miles. In this were infinitely more buffalo than I'd ever seen or witnessed in a view. And I think in another section he says over a thousand. And then he saw the Great Falls. So the Great Falls is probably right in this area, and he saw that and said it was, uh, was able to gaze on this sublimely grand spectacle, the grandest sight you've ever seen. So there's no longer a Great Falls because there's a dam there, um, which is the Great Falls Dam here, Moroni Dam is here, and this is a map of the portage around the Great Falls, so if you're interested in history, go to the, the Lewis and Clark Museum in Great Falls is a pretty interesting 
place to visit, but they portaged around and it was not too far from where the Moroni Dam is today. So he was standing somewhere in this location when he saw it. And nowadays we have Google Earth, which is much easier to see where you're going. And on 87, it's about a half hour, 20 minute drive. And this is what, <coughs> what the dam actually looks like. It's a hydroelectric dam and they generate 48 megawatts of energy, which is a lot. So the, the project is to replace all of the gates in this dam. So they're taking out all the old ones, putting in the new ones. And the old ones, you can see here, are a radio. This might be a better view here. A radio gate, radio painter gate is what they're called. And they're taking those out and putting in a slide gate. So when they have to let the water through, they have to raise the gate. And these older ones would collect ice and build up on them. And they were working as well. They were built in the 1930s, so almost 100 years old. So now they're, they're uh, replacing those old vertical gates. And part of that is they had to cut into the side of the gate after they took the old ones out. And since it's a vertical gate, they slide, they have very precise measurement they needed. So my job was to scan that or measure that to make sure they were in the correct specifications. This is a design drawing they had, and you can see here um, the gate difference. There we go. And this is a very exact measurement. They have about an eighth of an inch difference there. You can see some reflective stickers in these pictures. These tubes are to uh, allow heat to go through the dam so it heats up those guides so they don't freeze up in the winter time. So they're going to pump hot water and antifreeze through there to keep it from, you know, being frozen solid and not going to get it. And then they had to tie rebar into the gate guides and pour concrete. So what I was asked to do is measure the Measure the uh, stickers that they place at certain intervals. And you can see those there. Um, there's a 36 feet tall, they're about 34 feet apart. And actually, the, the dimensions are, I think I have it on, oh, design dimensions right here. So, two foot four and an eighth, two foot four and five eighths for the difference in the guides for E and F, for A and E. And they measured it at 2 feet, 10 feet, 18 feet, 26 feet, and 36 feet. So I guess for the math guys here, you see the, the pattern for given each of these numbers. 2, 2 plus 3 and 5 is 10. 3 plus 8 is 18. Nobody read that chapter in school. <laughs> All right. So I had to set up. And here's the uh, how we express our error is with standard deviation in survey. So standard deviation is about one hundredth of a foot in northern easting and height is pretty consistent. That's probably as good as I could set up. I don't know that I could get any smaller error than that unless it was a permanent setup and, and permanent control points. Our students do that same exact setup. They use the resection setup part of their lab. So you can see here they set up and their standard deviation is about a tenth, six hundredths, and seventeen hundredths in the elevation. So those two are, would probably be okay if you were just needing a, a rough layout. You wouldn't probably lay out a building with that, but it's the first time they've done it and they learn how to do it. So it's not too bad for your first time setting up. But it's called the resection where you measure three different points and then calculate. Most people would just say, oh, I triangulated where I'm at. That's kind of a oversimplification. But the, the math is pretty complicated. But if you have a, a total station that has a program, it does everything for you. So you know, all you have to do is measure the points. So this one is where I would set up and scan. And actually, I would measure each point. So I'm measuring the point, and these two top pictures are, are the total stations the camera taking a picture in the wide angle and the zoom lens uh, when I measure the point. 
And then in addition to measuring it, I scan it um, just in case I want to verify something or to, <clears throat> to check something. And a scan would look something like this. And you can see where the stickers are reflected in a different color. This is a light intensity reflection, so each color indicates a different strength of light intensity. So the, the orange is metal, the yellow is concrete, and these blue and green are the stickers, which didn't seem to reflect as much as I thought. I thought those would have the brightest reflection, but I think it's because the, the point measuring light and the scanning light are two different wavelength so the reflection shows up here. So once you scan something you get what's called a point cloud. So this is a collection of all of the points during the scan. And I don't remember exactly how many points. This might be something like 100,000 individual points. And I could specify with the total station I have the spacing of the points I want. So if I want it on 100th of a foot, or 200th of a foot, or 300th, or 6 inches, or foot, I can specify how far to space that vertically and horizontally at a certain distance. And the total station I have will collect 1,000 points a second. Uh, a normal total, I, I should say, a, a dedicated scanner will collect about a million points a second. So if I had a regular scanner, I could set it up in the middle of the room and it would take a million points a second, probably scan the room in less than 30 minutes. Um, with the one I have, it would probably set up and take probably two or three hours, and just not fast as a rate. But the, the advantage I have is I can also take total station measurements for or direct points, whereas a normal scanner can't do that. And once you have a point cloud, that's where you start to um, look at your information, analyze your information, you can zoom in. So each one of these is an individual point that was recorded, again, based on the spacing, they're probably at a hundredth of a foot apart, or eighth of an inch. And these points here that are, have the numbers, those are the ones that I actually measured with the, with the crosshairs and the reflected point. So I have both the scan and the measured points in the same point cloud, it shows everything together. And the reason I use a point cloud is it's so much data. If you have 200,000 points, it'll just fog down your, your computer. So what it does is just calls it one thing, point cloud, and then you can extract one point at a time if you want to collect that point. So it, it's easier on the computer to process. And the other thing you can do is if you only want to uh, look at a, a small portion of that scan, you can slice it or put it in a box and then exclude everything outside of that box, which makes it handy. So if I go back here, I don't necessarily want to look at all of these other heights if I'm only going to analyze this one height at a time. It's just you know, less, less chance for here, less chance to, to be looking in the wrong spot. You can focus on the area you're interested in. Uh, this is a screenshot of the software, and then I have a, a video kind of showing you how I go through it with the, the mouse the cursor and the point cloud and show you how that works with the software here.
it's not as big of a design, but yes. What What are you doing that for? Like, what What are you trying to do? In okay, so what I'm trying to do is see these purple lines. I've already measured these purple lines, but if I only wanted to get these distances, or <coughs> let me back up a couple slides here. I want to get these distances right here, mm -hmm. and I want to get these distances at. Two feet from the ground, ten feet from the ground, eighteen feet from the ground. So I need these dimensions to write into this sheet here. What those dimensions are. So. So you build a model of it, and then you go calculate them all. So that. Right. So this is the model here. Each one of those purple lines here that represents a different height. And I only want to look at one height. Whoops. One height at a time. I don't want to look at the whole thirty-six feet. I can squish it down and it's a little bit easier. So I, I for example, cut it down to two inches high. I only have to worry about that. I'm not going to accidentally take a point that's a foot higher and get a vast little distance. So that answer your question. Yep, yep. Okay. So you can see the reflective stickers barely. The screen doesn't quite show as good as the computer, but you can make those out here. They, they show up. And I was actually lucky I scanned this one because the contractor put the stickers on and they were in the wrong spot. So I, I shot all the stickers, but I couldn't use those measurements because they were in the wrong spot. <laughs> They're laughing because that never happens, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to take the scan point and measure across because I had the scan data in addition to the point that was in the wrong spot. So this point here is supposed to go actually measure over to here, but they put their sticker here. So I was able to just measure and pick a scan point and get that distance. So same thing here. This one is supposed to be here and go straight across, but they put it here. So I had to pick that. So it was a double, double timing. So that was actually the first one after that. I think they got more, right? And then this is the line A that I need for the dimension, line B, line C, line D, e, so I could fill out that form to match these. This is the actual numbers. The software will generate a report for each line. I can pick all the lines and generate a report. And uh, you can see well, 33.985, 33.985, and it's supposed to be 34. So it's one and a half hundredths off of what it should be. And they have uh, some adjusting screws, screws there um, that they can move that in three dimensions. So they get these numbers at the top, and then their guys go correct that and adjust them to the correct dimensions. And then after that, just to show you what they do, they, they come on, come along and put in these um, gates. These are what the gates actually look like that move up vertically that replace the, the radio gates. They have wheels on the end, and uh, that's how they fit in the slides once they're done. So there's there's not a lot of room there for adjustment, but when I talk to the engineers, though, yeah, we have, we have a little bit because you have thermal expansion that's going to freeze and contract, move back and forth, and you have some for the bearing <coughs> pad that can, can flex maybe an eighth of an inch. So there's a little bit, but they're pretty pretty tight tolerances. And then I put this one in here for my my big joke. Everybody seen the, the country music videos where they have the big party barge in the in the lake. This is the potty bar. <laughs> and then after that, they, they put the gates in, they use these uh, pulleys and cables, lift it up, lower it down. That's kind of the, the completion of one of the gates there. <coughs> All right, so, uh, yes? Back to that thermal expansion, when you were setting those opening widths, were you uh, ambient surface temperature control for those widths that you were shooting to? No, it was just... It was, uh, I mean, it varied somewhere in the summer, somewhere in the fall, so there were different temperatures. So you didn't have any specification that said 60 degrees no. range, this is your width, if it's colder or warmer? No. It was, we, it was yeah. just whatever it was outside. I would say all of them were above freezing, and that might be their criteria with the uh, heated, yeah. heated side, because they're, they're probably going to heat it up to, you know, 40 degrees, so it doesn't freeze, that's probably the limit. But no, that, that's a good question. Man. All right, so the next one is a, a grading application. I do this 
this in here. Uh, Sports Service Society are providing vivid examples of excellence. Uh, that was George Will. This is the uh, ball court at Chichen Itza. So many cultures have different uh, athletic events. This is anybody been to Chichen Itza? Did you visit the ball court? We did. You see the, the heads on that? That the losers got their heads cut off. Yep. The guys <laughs> so, Wait, wasn't it the winners? Because the winners got to sacrifice themselves yes. to the gods or something? Yeah, that was. Yeah. I don't know. I wasn't play that game, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Put your heads cut off my mouth. But, you know, you think about the Greeks, that the Olympics, the Romans had the Coliseum. Um, Europe has soccer. We have football or baseball. Basketball. Anybody basketball? There we go. So I think sports are one of those things that brings people together and gets them into uh, a common location. And this, this project happens to relate to the, the football field here. That was, that was my segue here. And these are the plans for the football field. One of the things that they needed were the uh, slopes verified. So about halfway through construction, they were done cutting it down to grade. They needed the, the three to one slope verified. And for those of you who know, aren't familiar, grade means slope, but it also means elevation. So when we say grade, typically I, I refer to a slope from this point to that point, or that ramp has a certain grade. But uh, it's also used to re refer to elevations. And this is the bowl as it was being cut out. These are the slopes that needed to be verified. And uh, I used my my superpower is being slightly lazy. So, <laughs> I don't want to walk up these slopes. Is that kind of a pain? These guys are laughing now. <laughs> so I scanned it. So I set up on a couple locations. You can see I, I have the highest reflection as the closer I am to the instrument. But I set up here, and I set up here, and I scanned that so I didn't have to walk up and down those slopes. And you can see here is what the troll station looks like when it's scanning. And again, it generates a point cloud. I probably did like a six inch interval. I didn't need it that close together. Um, and then I could verify the slopes. Again, I could get a slope report with every line. So I put a line in several locations. And then I got a, a slope report. It gives you the height, 30 feet almost. Um, vertical distance 10 feet, 30 to 10 is a 3 to 1 slope. So uh, the, the three, instead of giving them seven pages of this, I just gave them a sheet that looked like that. And you can look at it and see here's the slope, here's the location. If they wanted somewhere else, it's easy to just go in the software, pick point A to point B, and it tells me the slope. So that was that was how the slope was verified there. The other thing, sometimes I, I uh, get off on a, a tangent here. And I like making videos, so I have to. You're hired, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> you can see I picked up an excavator in the scan there.
And, and a scan like this would probably take, you know, 10 minutes. So, again, back to walking up and down those slopes, that's going to take you more than 10 minutes to do that. So I'll move on here to speed things up. So the other part of the field project to use this to verify, they were cutting the slopes. Um, you can see that its surface was just pretty stiff because it was raising the front of that bulldozer off the ground. That's a pretty heavy piece of equipment. And then when it was wet, it was pretty mucky. And they had needed the verification on each layer. So they have a subgrade layer, a gravel layer, and a grade layer. Each one of those layers needed a, a verification on a 25 foot interval. Uh, for the subgrade, it said if bills required, they can use gravel, sand, or earth. And they were looking, you can see the chunky material that was taken out of there, that instead of putting that back in and trying to get it to a, a certain grade. In this case, the color, tolerance was a quarter inch, so they had a plus or minus a quarter inch or two hundredths, um, which is a pretty tight tolerance for uh, getting a grade. So this is, this is tough material to get that way because if it's too wet, you leave ruts and it bushes out. And if it's too dry, you end up cutting it and it's, it's uh, cut below it and you can't compact it right. So what I did there is I scanned it, the software gives me a, a cut filled sheet. So I could see just by the color, if it's white, it's right on grade. If it's red, it's low. And if it's blue, it's too high, it's, it's filled. Or cut, excuse me. So you can see the blue corresponds with the drain gravel at the top. So that's really not part of the field. So this area was all too low. Instead of filling it up with the dirt they took out, they just put in extra gravel. So that was a lot of specifications. You put in extra gravel, so they put in about an inch or two of extra gravel. On top of the fabric, um, and then to get the, well, I should back up. They were setting grade with this, with GPS for this part. So they were using both position system, um, integrated control of their equipment. So they were probably a tenth, two tenths off just because they're in a bowl and it's GPS. So I think this, you guys have a lot of contractors that use the integrated controls. And how close do they get? On dirt? Your tolerance is uh, 1500s now. 1500s. Gravel is tighter, about 7 8. Yeah, so they were, they were probably 1500s, 2 inches, somewhere in there. So they put that in. So they got the laser level out to, to do this part. The laser level shoots out a, a light, and somebody holds a rod, and it beeps slow if it's too low, fast if it's too high, and it, you make your adjustments with the, the equipment. You can see the bobcat here. So they would cut it down. Fill it in if it's too low, take a shot just to verify that, and then, yes? Did they have machine grade control on most of their equipment, or was this POGO grade checks? This one was POGO, this was a... Uh, oh, it was laser. Laser, laser level right okay. there. Yep. For the next layer, they had it integrated with the control. <laughs> so they just had a, a person walking around with the bobcat, checking the grade as they went to make sure they were the right height. And then the spec said they have to have a surveyor check on a 25 foot by 25 foot grid, uh, which I did again, get seven pages of notes to verify that. Here's the sheet that tells you where all those shots were. Everything matched out, everything was good. Um, and then just for kicks, I didn't have to do this, but I uploaded it in the software anyway, so I thought, well, let's make a graph. And then you got a histogram, yay, histogram grade. <laughs> so this tells you, this gives you a good quick synopsis, okay, how much I have about 40% plus or minus, minus, I have about 28% plus one, 15%. So it kind of shows you where everything's distributed as far as the as Um Okay, so that's Then they put on the surface layer. They had two core, aggregate drainage rock and surface aggregate drainage rock. They put these drains in, put the rocks on top, and then they had a little bit finer material, sandy material that goes on top of that. Uh, so that, again, that was a requirement to be checked. This is the, the control that, that they were using. So this was a laser level, and then it was attached, I guess the receiver was attached to the bucket of the bobcat, so it would raise it up or down based on whatever the 
I get the laser ones. And they did program the slope two directions. It's a dual axis. And uh, all the driver had to do was go forward or back. He didn't have to raise the bucket or anything. He just, just adjusted everything for him. And then again, check that. Everything was good. And then I thought, oh, let's get into some statistics here. So for my quality assurance class, we get into statistics. And I, I did an Excel spreadsheet here. I came up with some summary statistics. You get the standard deviation um, and then determine what your Z value is and how many fell asleep right there. <laughs> so I, re I remember the statistics by giving them personality. So <laughs> meaning he's just average guy, right? Nothing special. Standard error, he's, he's a cousin of standard deviation, but you never see him. You never use him. Um, median, he's the guy that thinks the center line of the road. He's always in the middle. Mode, you see them everywhere. They're on social media. I saw her down in the library down in the sub. And she was a tagger. She's not here now, but it's here everywhere. And then standard deviation, if he's your friend, he's a good guy, as long as he's, you know, around range. But sometimes standard deviation, you take him to a party, he starts a fight, starts picking up people. He gets, get that number too high, it creates problems for you. So he's kind of a troublemaker. Then you have the, the kurtosis twins, one's high, one's short. It's Eunice, they're off center. So that's how you remember your, uh, Statistics. We'll just give them personality. <laughs> um, so using statistics, you can see that with the numbers from the, the previous table, even though every single measurement was within specifications, uh, if, you, if you extend that to the population, about 10% would, would fall outside of the normal range or within three standard deviations. So the next thing I do with the class is, okay, let's create a control chart. And let's, let's examine the process, not necessarily each individual measurement, but let's look at the process. So the laser was set up in the middle, it's about 180 feet to the end. And is the process in control? So I ask him, here's the control chart. We're going to take each one of these uh, rows as a subgroup. And we're going to put those here. Each subgroup average is one of these points. This is the overall average. And you notice any patterns or runs? Does anybody see anything? So it starts here, continually goes up to about eight, and then it randomly goes up and down. So what happens at eight? Eight was where the laser was set up. Mm -hmm. So looking at that, you could kind of make a guess as to maybe the laser was in one direction, slightly out. And, it, and by off, I mean 100 of a foot or less. I mean, that's not very much. And if you look up the specs for a laser level at 200 feet, you're plus or minus 100. So it's within its spec, but it looks like it's, it's consistent. It varies until the middle. And then you look at the range. So each set of rows has a range. And you can see definitely towards the middle, but the closer you were to the laser, the less range you have or the tighter measurements were across that row. So looking at the process, you can say, okay, your relationship to where that laser is, is uh, affects where your uh, points lie in or out of spec. And then after all that high tech stuff, the field guys came in with the string line and ran it from here to here and then filled in the, the low spots and <laughs> shoveled off the high spots. So all that high, high tech stuff was pretty cool, but the string line still works. <laughs> Uh, and then this is a final point cloud, so I actually set up a few different places, scanned the field afterwards for the has builds. So I have this model in the, in the computer, but you can look at it um, in, the, in the point cloud and get any dimension you want. And then this is a, a picture from our senior project in 2017. That was three years before the field was built. Their senior project was to design it. They actually designed, a, went out and measured it with the total station, um, created a surface, and then put a design surface, and put it in a 3D model, and then cut it out, in, or built it up actually in the 3D printers. All right. Um, last 
case study uh, measurements to inaccessible points. So one, one advantage of scanning things is you don't have to walk to the point to measure it, or you don't have to have a second person walk to the point. You can set up and <coughs> use your, your total station to measure it. If you're on the right track, you'll get run over if you just sit there. Well, this is a, a railroad project, and I didn't want to walk up on the track. So I set up and scanned it. Um, and you can see this height here is about 3360 down to 3560, or 3260. It's about a 100 foot elevation change from the top to the bottom. So that's a fairly steep grade to hike up and down. After they uh, built it, the, the real reason they wanted it measured was, of course, for pay quantity, for seating, and for the amount of earthwork that was put in. So I was given the, the model. Whoops, maybe I'll back up one second. This model is from the designer. That's the existing surface before any construction started. And then I scanned it. You can see the picture. And this red line or this orange line shows you the scanning area that I, I selected. So I could scan a polygon, I could scan a rectangle, or I could do a global scan with everything around. So I, I picked a polygon, selected that area, scanned it, and then collected the data. Um, same thing up here. I didn't have to walk up any, any slopes or down any slopes. And this um, took it into the scanning software, again measured the slopes, it calculates the area three-dimensionally, the area two-dimensionally, and then also the volume, uh, 26,000 yards in this case. So, much easier to, to do that than to walk up and down the slopes. And our, our students do that in, in a few different classes, surveying, and he said we don't do the scanning part, but we can calculate quantities. And that's kind of important when you're either for the owner or for the contractor, you want to know how much work did I actually do, that's what you're going to get paid for. Uh, other inaccessible locations, again, stockpiles. So I would scan a stockpile, I would set up, measure it on a one foot interval, that seems like a lot, but uh, it's a lot more points than uh, walking up and down with that I would ever get. So this scan here has 13,318 cloud points and then 194 manually measured points that I put on that. So I could generate a, a um, volume. The software allows you to do a stockpile volume based on your scan and area. And uh, in this case it's 20, coincidentally 26,000 yards. <laughs> completely different product, 26,000 yards. But counts want to know that right more. How much is it? Inventory. And you can show that a few different ways to report um, just the, the tin surface or the scan surface. Other inaccessible points, like I said, it has a camera on the total station so you can measure uh, trenches, conduits and trenches for as built so you get buried later. If you measure before, you get an XYZ coordinate and you can locate it later on after it's uh, buried and built. Same thing with railroad tracks, you know, railroad doesn't like you walking on their tracks, you can measure it from the side, you don't have to actually physically walk on the track. Just take a picture and document it to XYZ. And then with the, the imaging and the software, um, you can take a panoramic image, it's going to take different points. I, I take that back, it's going to take different photographs, mesh them together into one photograph. From there, what you're going to do is uh, you can attach that image to your scan so everything's true color or you can just use the pictures to, to identify points. So I can create a point as long as I have two different locations or two setups. It will take an angle, angle, intersection for the <coughs> points and calculate an X, Y, Z. So in this case I, I zoomed in on two photos, I picked it in this setup here, this setup here, I guess it was a row of grains or some points they had on there. And it calculates my northern easting and elevation, and then gives me my error, which is 200, uh, northern easting 100. And uh, if you're satisfied with that, you can actually create a generator point, which is, is good enough for a lot of things to within that range. You could, you know, if I said, hey, you cut the ball at this coordinate, you get, you're going to get close enough to cut that ball. Or you could just go ahead and 
and pick the scan point uh, out of the point cloud. So I zoomed in on this area, picked out the point. It doesn't show up quite so well on the screen, but um, there's a bunch of points here. You get really good eyesight, you can see those. So how do these case studies help our uh, students? Oops. We got the quote, how are missed by most people because it looks like overall, or dressed in overalls looks like work. <laughs> Uh, so, it helps demonstrate real-world real applications of surveying and scanning. This, this happens to be two that have the true color point cloud, so I took a picture before I scanned it and attached that color from the photo onto those points. Uh, this is a light intensity. demonstrates how point cloud data is viewed after it's processed and collected. Uh, this, this one that I did take a picture. Uh, maintain a connection between academia and the professional world. This photo here is actually a field trip our students took last year to a dam. Uh, it sits north of the Plainsman. And you can look right there. They've got a laser level set up, GPS set up. you got to learn about hydraulics. And it teaches them how much water can go through that, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> she teaches. I don't know if they learn it, but I teach it. You teach it. That's what they uh, soils, you've got to learn about soils, how it's compacted in a dam. Uh, also, shows unique projects with familiar engineering principles. Sometimes you get stuck over here in the textbook, and I uh, design table, but what does that really mean? How is that applied actually in the real world? Sometimes that jump is the thing that helps student, uh, students understand the theory better, or make them want to understand it better. Uh, science can amuse and fascinate us all, but engineering is, <coughs> is engineering that changes the world. Any questions? You have to put a like a boundary when you're doing the scan for top and bottom, like on a football field. Do you have the top boundary, or is it just yes. it loses and kind of reflected and just automatically no. down? You, you pick the you pick a rectangle through the through the lens, so you pick the top boundary, or you can do a polygon if it's not a rectangle shape. You can trace, and it's a it's a stuck screen, so you can pick the points and it shows the camera as you view it. So if, if you just shoot up in the air, it'll, it'll shoot the light and never get a reflection back. So I always go over, overshoot the height that you think you need. Yes? Uh, what experience do you have with drone LiDAR? Any yet? I don't. I don't. <laughs> use that type of thing. Is that accurate? Not even close, I'd imagine? Yeah, I, I've been to a few seminars, but um, I've never personally used it. I, I think it's kind of the same technology because it has the the scanning portion. I think it's GPS reference, so it probably eliminates the GPS accuracy. And probably a ton of redundancy. Yeah. How yeah. close? How close was your shot when you scanned it versus actually shooting reflected on that dam? Did you ever check that? The scan shot versus the actual shot for the reflective triggers? Yeah, those are those are close. I think I had maybe one shot that was I picked a scan point that wasn't right, and I think what had happened is I scanned the back side of that channel, which is a half inch off. And sometimes it's hard to tell the three dimensions. Um, so if you pick a point that's half inch apart from one side of the other, you can't tell that the color. So. But picking the sticker and the scan point, they're you know thousands of a foot off. Which again, the limit of that machine is probably one millimeter to two millimeters, so within the tolerance. Do you ever get to put the sticker on yourself, or do you just have the contractors? <laughs> the contractors, I told them you guys put the sticker where you want all day. <laughs> and you can blame them when it's working. Oh well, yeah. <laughs>
No, usually they say, yeah, we'll be ready tomorrow, and you show up. Oh, we're just going to stick the stickers on now, and it takes an hour and a half, so. <laughs> they're, they're not quite ready, but that's how the world feels sometimes. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you.